Hello, everyone. Adam Wanter, SOA Past President, and your moderator here. Um, presenting today will be Virginia Dressler, Nicole Sutton, and Cindy Lindsay. Um, just real quick housekeeping, directly following the conclusion of this session, in this same Zoom feed will be the SOA business meeting slash SOA update presented by SOA President Sherry Goody, um, Sherry Gowdy. Uh, so make sure to stick around. Um, so now on to the introductions. Virginia Dressler is the digital projects librarian at Kent State University. Her specialty areas are project management and digitization, working with the university's unique collections. She also serves as a subject liaison for the School of Art, VCD, and School of Information at Kent State. She holds a Master of Library and Information Science from Kent State University um, from 2007, a Master's of the Arts in Art Gallery and Museum Studies from the University of Leeds 2003, and a Certificate in Advanced Librarianship, Digital Libraries from Kent State University 2014. Her research areas include privacy and digital collections and the right to the be forgotten. She is the author of Framing Privacy in Digital Collections with Ethical Decision Making in 2018. In her spare time, she wrangles, wrangles toddler twins. Um, next is Nicole Sutton, is a local history and genealogy librarian at Columbus Metropolitan Library. She holds bachelor degrees in marketing and interpersonal communication from the University of Central Oklahoma, a master of science and entrepreneurship from Oklahoma State University, and a master of library and Infor information studies from the University of Oklahoma. Nicole taught public speech first as a tutor and later as an adjunct instructor at the University of Central Oklahoma. She has a passion for, passion for research and helping others learn how to access information. Outside of the library, Nicole can most often be found playing tabletop games, practicing yoga, or listening to autobiographical, autobiographical audiobooks. Cindy Lindsay is a librarian in local history and genealogy at Columbus Metropolitan Library. Before starting at CML in 2019, she was a local history librarian at Bexley Public Library for five years, originating their digital history collection and serving as liaison to the Bexley Historical Society. Cindy has a bachelor's degree in social studies education from Miami University and a master's in library and information science from Kent State University. In her spare time, she enjoys reading, doing gene genealogy, and spending time with her friends. So now I will turn it over to uh, Virginia. Thanks so much, Adam and Betsy for the introduction. I am going to share my slides. As these are loading, I wanted to say thank you to all of the SOE folks who made this happen. I know it's a lot of work to put on a virtual conference, so we appreciate your time. All right. And Adam, can you give me a quick okay that this looks good? You are good. All right. Thanks so much. All right. I will be talking um, today about some remote work projects that we had for our student workers last spring. Um, I will start off a uh, little bit of a timeline. Um, I think as probably most of the folks um, on this call, we went into remote uh, work after the state shutdown in mid-March. Um, this really moved pretty fast. I think we had about a week or so lead in as we were sort of preparing to work from home. Um, the dorm shut down almost completely uh, around the same time. I think we had an extra week right before spring break for students and faculty to kind of transition to uh, remote teaching. Um, but around the same time, we got a call from our uh, university library administration as a call for student work from home projects. Um, so this is really a pretty short timeline. I think back on this personally of going from working in person to being home with uh, two then three-year-olds while my husband was uh, an essential worker. This seems like a very long time ago in my mind, but um, we quickly amassed a list of projects for our library student workers with um, an early April uh, kickoff. So the call for remote work, um, they asked for a few things as they were kind of collecting these projects together, um, which unit was pr proposing the project, a uh, short description, um, any considerations such as technology requirements or other training, um, how this work would be reported out, um, contact person that would act as kind of a project manager, and whether or not the specific project was open to other student employees in the library outside of your own home unit and then any other notes. So this information was collected in a big um, open Google Sheets uh, spreadsheet. 
Um, so we had 16 library units respond with over 70 projects, which I think is pretty impressive in a two week call. Um, my digital projects unit, which is myself and one full time staff member proposed four of these 70 projects. Um, the first was a transcription project. Um, the next two were optical character recognition, OCR cleanup. Um, and the last one was an ORCID project for our IR. So I'll go into a little bit more details on each of these. Um, but first I thought I'd talk a little bit about how we came up with these projects. We really focused on things that had um, pretty minimal tech requirements. Um, we really didn't know kind of on an individual basis what students had for setup once they went home. I know our main IT department was really scrambling on getting hotspots out and um, loaning laptops. So we didn't want to make any assumptions and we didn't want to make anything overly complex. Um, so we really focused on projects that just um, required a web connection, um, access to Google Drive. Um, all our staff and faculty are Microsoft Outlook. On Microsoft Outlook, all our students are on Gmail and the Google Drive suite. So that's where a lot of my projects that I work on with students live anyways. Um, and then some really kind of basic text editors too. So we really didn't want there to be a software requirement to be, you know, uh, to impede any volunteer work. Uh, we wanted the instructions to be fairly simple with little to no training. Um, and like I said, each project had a person kind of as an um, project contact, contact um, the transcription project and the two OCR projects were um, with me while the uh, ORCID project was with my colleague, Dave Oswick. Um, so the first project I thought I'd highlight was our transcription project. Um, we looked at all our existing digital collections in our institutional repository. So this doesn't include our special collections and archives content, but it's kind of other image collections and um, a lot of our regional campus digital collections too. Um, one thing I was thinking about yesterday is uh, one of the other presenters was talking about um, handwriting was the one student that we really had um, who kind of participated the most in this project was one of my grad students from last spring. Um, and I kind of took it as an assumption that people know how to read cursive. But I think that, um, you know, as I think about it, especially with my niece, who's around 12 and does not know how to write or read in cursive, that maybe this is kind of a more timely project than we'd even thought from the get-go. Um, but our main goal was really creating these, um, you know, tran transcriptions that would allow for full text um, searchability, but also um, provide an accessibility point too, was kind of one of our goals to provide transcriptions of um, images and uh, audiovisual and handwritten materials. So I'll show our item level spreadsheet in just a moment. That was kind of our main project point. Um, we had a link to each digital item. Uh, Google Docs was really, uh, or Google Drive was really our central place for this. We used a Google Doc template um, for each student worker to use to copy and use for each item. And then once completed, the transcriptions were ingested into the IR. Um, so I have here a screenshot of one of our items from our Ohio Winery collection. Um, I think the one thing we really thought about from the student point of view was really kind of minimizing um, the different pieces of this project. So while we did, uh, the staff member and I did a lot of work to get the item level spreadsheets up and running. It was really the focus of the student work was just to do this transcription work. And then the staff member and I would do the ingestion later to kind of simplify it a little bit. Um, so here's a screenshot of one of our um, collections. It has the link to the digital item, a title. Both of these were used in the template, um, a note about assignment and completion. And then there's another column of when the transcript is then um, uploaded to the IR. Um, so it's definitely a lot, you know, it was definitely more of a manual um, process, but it was also something that I think the transcription work was something we all felt um, was really important as a, as a priority. Um, the next two were optical character recognition or OCR cleanup projects. Um, we had two collections specifically in mind, our digital student newspaper, the D Digital Daily Kent Stater, which has around 90 years of um, online, and then our College of Podiatric Medicine yearbooks. Um, these were two collections that we knew had um, kind of inaccurate OCR for different reasons that I'll talk about in a second, but that we had been kind of a, on our um, radars as things that we'd want to do if we had the time. So the shutdown last spring kind of afforded that time. Um, so we looked around our digital daily Kent Stater is hosted on a platform called Viridian. 
Um, so in 2016, we had paid, on top of our regular subscription, we had paid for what they call a user text correction tool. Um, you create an account to do the corrections, but it's kind of nice because it takes some of the administrative pieces around OCR correction off of our plate. Um, so we looked around for instructions, knowing that quite a few other um, places also use Viridian. We found a really nice existing video tutorial, which was really great. Um, we cre also created instructions um, for our student workers as well. For both of these projects, um, the CPM yearbooks, we um, exported the OCR as text files so that they could look at the yearbook in front of them and a text file and do corrections on that. We got a lot more volunteers for the student newspaper than the yearbooks. I think it might have in part been because the correction tool is just a little bit slicker and nicer <laughs> for the um, student newspaper. Uh, let's see. So we used, for project tracking, I had these color-coded project sheets that are, um, I would will admit, slightly horrifying to look at, but these were from our original um, digitization process from the um, Kent Stater project. We had outsourced this to Backstage, who I think had digitized around 70 of the 90 years of our digital newspaper. Um, when these were coming in and we were doing spot checking, we were really um, looking at these kind of issue by issue, um, we had some OCR problems with our early years from the 1920s that were um, digitized from microfilm. Um, we had some ones later. Um, these have been bound by semester and the first page of each bound volume had this really obnoxious uh, sticker on the first page that was kind of blocking the first couple characters um, along the left side. So that was pretty obnoxious. So we did this color coding to kind of know that we wanted to come back and kind of return to that OCR issue. Um, so we like the transcription, we assign these um, to individual students to do, which I think worked pretty well. The um, issues ran about probably 10 pages to 30 pages, so it seemed like about a, a good size for uh, students to work on. Um, we did do some quality assurance as students were working on this. The Kent Stater project was the one I had the most students respond to. Um, so we wanted to make sure they were kind of doing this right before assigning more. Um, I did switch from individual issue assignments to assigning multiple issues because I found a lot of students were working sort of late nights, weekends, um, and they were just, I couldn't keep up with them. Um, so that worked out well. The folks that did really well were folks that really like, I think, correcting typos. So I, I did a couple screenshots here. Um, the upper right is the searchlight, which is the first uh, title from our student newspaper. Um, our Viridian interface, you see the um, newspaper image along the right side, and then on the left, you see the raw text. Um, so I highlighted a couple areas there. This one was from microfilm, and I think it's from that crease along the um, middle of the paper there that just kind of threw the OCR. So that was one example from this um, newspaper. The yearbooks were a little bit different. I think um, most of the OCR issues were with some of the formatting decisions with the yearbook. Um, we got a lot of feedback, people wanting to search names, not having much luck. So that was something we knew we wanted to circle back and correct. So last spring, it's definitely a great opportunity to do this. Um, and last but not least, our ORCID project. Um, ORCID IDs are a unique researcher identifier. Um, there's others besides ORCID out there, but ORCID's kind of the one that we've preferred to use in our institutional repository. Um, this is also a project we had no volunteers. I almost didn't include it for today, but I thought I would mention it <laughs> just in case it was of interest. Um, we were asking students to verify Kent State researchers with their ORCID ID. Um, participants would need access to Google Drive and to our Kent State directory. Um, since we're a public institution, all current staff and faculty are open or available in our open directory off our website. Um, the plan was that we would assign these in groups of 20 um, and ask uh, the students to find out if that person was an active um, teaching faculty or researcher employed at Kent State. We had in our first search for ORCID IDs at Kent State, we have a lot of folks who um, were past or current students that get them as they're putting their um, theses or dissertations into Ohio Link. So we just wanted to focus really on um, teaching faculty and researchers. Um, and then we also asked while they had the directory page up to see if they could add any other extra information such as department name or research institute. Um, the hope with this project was really building our author profiles and our IR. Um, our very talented uh, developer here on our Islandora instance has developed a tool to kind of automate 
pulling in citation and publication information with ORCID IDs. Um, so this is a project we're still really excited about, but maybe just going a different direction. Uh, let's see. So I think overall, um, it was a pretty successful pilot. Um, this was really work from early April through the end of our spring semester, which was probably the first week of May. Um, so the Kent Stater, I think, was definitely numbers wise the most students who responded. We completed um, two years of OCR correction on our earliest issues. Um, we completed transcription of all handwritten contact content in our Ohio Winery collection. Um, we did not have su students work over the summer um, last year, but then when they returned in the fall, um, they returned to in-person work. Um, so I think looking forward, if we ever kind of thought about this again, and we certainly um, have been doing some of these as staff since then too, um, but I think we'd think about the software piece maybe a little bit more. Um, we now have a remote computer lab that our systems folks have put out to kind of help solve some of the software issues, especially Adobe Acrobat and Photoshop that are really expensive licenses. Um, I'd love to think about uh, remediation work for digital accessibility, especially PDFs um, and AV. Um, and I think what I really found successful was really that, that small assignments, small issues, items, um, seemed to work the best. I think uh, my one student who did all the transcription work got really excited when we um, finished up the Ohio Winery collection and was like, oh, we're done. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> like this is just the tip of the iceberg. But I think that kind of small bites um, kind of worked really well. And I think kind of celebrating some of those small victories are good, too. Uh, so with that, I think I will pass it on to uh, Nicole and Cindy. Thanks, Jenny. That was such a great <laughs> presentation. I really uh, love all the work that you were able to get done. I'm going to share my screen here and reiterate uh, Jenny's thanks for everyone at SOA for putting this together. It's been an amazing conference, and we are just so happy to be here with you and have the opportunity to share our projects with you. So my name is Nicole Sutton, as Adam said, and I'm here with Cindy Lindsay. We are librarians in the Local History and Genealogy Division of the Columbus Metropolitan Library. And we're going to talk to you today about some of the projects that we completed over the pandemic. Uh, we're gonna refer to those as curbside projects. You will also hear us refer to um, Columbus Metropolitan Library as CML and our division, Local History and Genealogy as LHG. Uh, and one other thing, terminology wise, we call our patrons customers. So now that we have all that terminology out of the way, uh, we'll get into telling you about these projects and what we learn from them and what we're going to take forward into our processes um, using our, the lessons that we learned. So let's start with just a little bit of background information just to um, give you some context. So let's travel back to 2020 very briefly. No one wants to be there very long. So um, just to give you some context. In March of 2020 is when the, March 13th is when the library closed to customers and the employees started working remotely. Then about a month later, we realized that the pandemic was going to be ongoing for a while. So that's when the library board made the decision to, um, for public service staff to furlough um, all work titles under below librarian. So librarian and managers in um, public service were still working, though we had reduced hours as well. Everyone below that was furloughed. So that was over 600 employees who were uh, impacted by that. And because local history and genealogy has, we have a physical um, reference collection and we have our archival collection, but we also have My History, which is our digital collection. We were able to help create work for people who were staying on for the librarians and managers that were going to be staying on with those reduced hours and uh, provide work for them to do. So we did that over the summer with varying levels of CML services. So we had just curbside for a while once we did open up for customers. Then we had limited public access where there were some uh, tasks that people could come in, customers could come in to do in the library. So we had varying levels of people on the projects at that point. And then the numbers got higher. So we went back to curbside. And at that point, we were uh, bringing on some more staff in August of 2020. We brought on some homework help uh, center staff to help us with that metadata project again. I'll give you an overview that actually Cindy will give you an overview of all the projects in a moment, but just to kind of give you this background context first. And then 
uh, thing, numbers were okay. So we, we were open for a limited access. LHG actually started taking appointments and then the numbers started to rise again. And in November, we pulled back CML, uh, entirely pulled back to curbside. And that's when the projects really started to kick in those curbside projects. So we had that metadata project. We also started the image replacement project in August, but in November is when we actually started our scanning project, which is the other big project that we're going to talk to you about. And all of those continued through until early this year in 2021. Uh, in February, CML opened up to customers again. Um, LHG was taking appointments um, so people could be in the building again. And at that point, that's when the project started to kind of taper off. So the image replacement project tapered off uh, around February. Uh, the scanning project tapered off. Really, it didn't uh, start to really come down until about last week. Uh, we still have a few people scanning, but not many, uh, because again, we opened up more widely on April 5th. So local history and genealogy, you can come in and visit us, no appointment necessary. So because the scanning project was an in-person project rather than a remote work, uh, we had to kind of scale that back because now we have people in the building. So now that you kind of have an understanding of what the timeline was, I'm going to pass it over to Cindy to talk to you about our goals and give you an overview of the projects that we worked on. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, so our main goal was to create meaningful work uh, for our organization. Uh, when November hit and the cases rose and we had to go back to curbside, um, nobody wanted to furlough or have another hours reduction um, for us. We wanted to maintain the hours, but in order to do that, everybody had to work towards uh, the goals of the organization, um, which one of those is, um, LHG is included in those. And so that was our main goal, is to create meaningful work that would further uh, the, the mission of LHG. Um, but we also wanted to tackle our backlog. So we had not been in the building from March until July. And even July, we didn't begin scanning again um, because we were worried about social distancing and the amount of touching of materials that goes into uh, any scanning project. Um, we also, before the, before the pandemic, we had finished re-scanning uh, a lot of images that we wanted to replace uh, in LHG, in, in my history. Um, images that 20 years ago had been uh, ha had been scanned poorly in, in one way or the other, and I'll, I'll show you examples uh, here in a bit. Um, but we, we need to replace all of those. We need to get those images into my history um, and replace them. Uh, we also had some a wish list of some things we wanted to do. We wanted to scan uh, Columbus City plans. We are the only ones that have some of those plans, uh, especially the older ones, especially some ones having to do with red lighting that that a lot of people are interested in um, and we wanted to get those online but like everyone else time is always a factor um, and then of course our collection is a reference only collection and unlike almost every other item in at cml nobody could place a hold on it nobody could um, and, and nobody could take it out uh, if and we had only been open to the public um, in September through through November. Um, and since we are the only ones that own some of those items, we are the only ones that can, that we are the ones that people come to to, to look at them. Um, and now we'll do a quick overview of all the projects we did. So the main project, uh, the two main projects that we'll talk about, Nicole will talk about the metadata project in a minute, um, but it, it was all remote work. Um, and it was all, it was almost all info staff, uh, whereas the scanning project was in person starting in November at the main library downtown in downtown Columbus, and that was for support staff. Uh, and then we also had the image replacement uh, project that, uh, that was also for support staff, and that's replacing those images I talked about with the, the nice, the nicely scanned images. Um, and that was remote at branches. So people, people didn't do those from home, but they did it at their home branch. Uh, and then we created, as we went through, we created some side projects um, for people that were just too good 
uh, at scanning that we couldn't keep up for. And we'll also talk about that, those in a bit. Great. Thanks, indeed. So yes, first, we're going to talk about the metadata collection and uh, that project and how it kind of evolved. Like Cindy mentioned, there were several different iterations. Again, when we first started it in May, it was just librarians working on it. And then we brought on more staff in August and then even more staff in November when the curbside projects really took off. So I want to talk about first the collections that we were working on. So we were creating metadata for in the beginning, six different collections for our My History digital collection. And with that, we were working with the King Arts Complex collection, the David Lucas collection, and then the Dublin Memories, which is Dublin Historical Society's collection, Columbus Memory, City of Columbus, which is some of those city plans that uh, Cindy mentioned, and then the Hilltop Photograph Collection. So we started with all six of those, but we realized as we brought more staff onto the project that it was better if we just condensed that down into two projects. So we really focused uh, later on on the King Arts Complex Collection and the David Lucas Collection. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background information about those two. So the King Arts Complex Collection is a collection of photographs from the Columbus Colin Post newspaper uh, that was a Black newspaper in Columbus from the 1960s till the 1990s. And King Arts Complex has the photo morgue. So we are helping them to scan those and get those online. Um, and it's a, a great collection. And we were we uploaded those and we needed help doing the metadata so this was a great opportunity to get that help the david lucas collection is a collection of photographs of columbus uh, david lucas donated them and he was the city photographer for the city of columbus in the 1970s um, he has some great stories about hanging out of helicopters to get aerial photos so there's just some amazing photographs of the city and the different events that happened in columbus and so we needed to work on the metadata for that as well all right, so now that you know which collections we were working in, I want to kind of talk to you about the preparation that we did to have people from all over CML from different branches who've maybe never worked on metadata before uh, work on this project with us. So we had to first develop process documents. We gave access to uh, edit the records. We had to create the spreadsheets to track assignments and their progress, and we provided virtual training. So I'll go into each of these a little bit more in depth. So first we had to develop the process documents. Uh, we had a few do documents already in place that were being used for volunteers. So really we just had to adapt those to be for internal staff. So like for the King Arts Complex, I was the project lead for that and I already had the document for the volunteers. So I adapted that for the librarians to work on it. And then from there, the other staff members who were also project leads on metadata collection, uh, they were able to then adapt the document that I created. And then we also had the metadata best practices document, which was actually just our internal document for creating uh, metadata in my history. And we just customized those for each collection that people were working on as well. So we just made those a little bit more customized. Next, we had to give access to edit the documents. And this was actually a decision that we had to make. So we could uh, have had people work in project client, or we could have them working in content DM administration. So the difference is with project client, they have to download software onto their computer, um, and then they would be creating the metadata and then uploading them to the public side uh, of my history. Or we could have them use content DM administration, which would mean that they could access uh, this in a browser, not have to download anything, but we would have to upload, we on the LHD team would have to upload the materials without any metadata and then have them edit them after they're already public, um, have the team edit them. So we ended up going with content DM administration, which meant we needed them to make WorldCat accounts and we needed to give them access to the accounts. And this just made more sense to us just so they didn't have to download software. And for like Cindy and I, who are, are Mac users, we can't use Project Client. Project Client is only for PCs. So it was just a, a better solution overall for us. So we went with Content DM administration, which you can see here. Uh, the next thing we needed to do was create spreadsheets to both track assignments and track their progress as they worked on the program. Um, so for the assignments, we use Smartsheet, which you'll see down there at the bottom. And this is actually an older screenshot because I'm going to talk a little bit about how that evolved and the lessons we learned using Smartsheet. 
Uh, but we would create assignments and much like Jenny, we would create smaller assignments in the beginning, give them a lot of feedback on those. And then once they were kind of uh, used to doing the metadata and more comfortable with it, we'd give them larger assignments. Um, in the beginning, when it was just the librarians, I would, uh, for the King Arts Complex, I would give them like an entire issue of the Columbus Column Post to work on the images for. Uh, but as we started to bring on more people and uh, August and then later in November, we realized that we just needed to make smaller assignments throughout and that worked better for us. For um, tracking their progress, we used an Excel spreadsheet and we just shared, saved that to SharePoint for everyone to access through there. And uh, basically people would log in weekly and track their the number of hours that they contributed to the project and the number of um, items that they edited. And they would just track that on a weekly basis. And then last thing to do to prepare is we had to provide them with virtual training. So for this, again, everyone's working remote. We decided to um, record a live training using Microsoft Teams. Um, so we would give the, the training live, but then we also recorded it so that it could be used later um, throughout the project as we brought more people on. So this is actually a screenshot from the live training that I did for the King Arts Complex. Um, and with that, we were able to use that recording even as the process changed and some of the instructions changed because we would use this to show them how to access smart sheets, record their stats, how to actually edit the metadata. And so even as our process changed, even with my limited uh, <laughs> uh, video editing skills, I was able to edit that video and it worked for us throughout the project. All right, so now that you've got an idea of what we did to prepare for the metadata project, let's kind of talk about the process um, so you understand how it worked. So the first thing was we had to upload the materials. So for that, um, I had to coordinate with our supervisors because again, I couldn't access project client that we used to upload the materials. So I would coordinate with our supervisors in local history and genealogy to get those uploaded. Later on, Cindy was actually able to get a staff laptop and a hard drive with the materials that we were working on so she could upload them, but I did have to coordinate. And as long as you can keep those communication lines open, it works great. Um, like I said, with tracking statistics, we used Excel, shared to or saved to SharePoint for that. And like I showed that screenshot, that worked well throughout. And we didn't start that until um, August when we brought people on, but we used that same spreadsheet throughout and it worked really well. The next thing I want to talk about is connecting with the team, and we use this, uh, we use Microsoft Teams to do this. So this was actually a really great way for us to just answer general questions. Um, we had a channel called LHD Metadata Team where they could post their questions. Sometimes they use the chat feature in Teams to message us directly as well, but for the most part, the questions were things that everyone had and would like to know the answers to, so they just post them publicly on the, the channel. We also use this for crowdsourcing identification. So again, these people, a lot of them had never worked with local history and genealogy materials before. They hadn't created metadata before, so they weren't familiar with a lot of the people that maybe we knew from working with materials with them. So they would post them to the page and then anyone on the local history and genealogy team could reply to them and say, oh, I know where that is, or I know who that is. And it was a really fun experience. This screenshot actually shows um, Cindy helping Barbara identify Edna L. Bryce, who was a local florist. Um, and yeah, we had identified her before and we were able to just share that information. And the other way that we were able to use Microsoft Teams to connect was through weekly video chats, um, weekly video check-ins. We had them every Wednesday, whoever was able to log on, they could ask their questions. We would talk about quirky metadata things that everyone was experiencing and how you handle them if they pop up for you and just be able to ask again, those general questions. And that worked really well for us. The last thing I want to talk about with the process is using Smartsheet for both creating the assignments and completing the quality control um, for the metadata assignments. So this is a more recent screenshot that shows you what the Smartsheet that we were using evolved into. So we still have the assignment field that's uh, called records to create. And then we move the assignment notes up so that it's right next to the assignment because that made more sense. And we moved that field that was there uh, uploaded by farther back because we realized that was more back end information for us and less for the people working on the project. And then we have the, the column where the people could uh, claim their project, metadata work done by, uh, the date that they had completed it. And then we also added more detail to the quality control um, 
columns as well. So you could see who did the quality control, when they did it. And then we also use the comments um, feature in Smartsheet, which really helped us streamline our quality control. Uh, we were just sending out individual emails to people, each project lead who was doing the quality control would send out those emails. But then we started using the comments field. You can tag the person that you're leaving comments for. They get an email that, hey, you've got some feedback. They look at it, they fix the records, and it just worked really well. So that was one of the things that we're going to take forward. We'll share all that at the end, but this is definitely one of the things that we appreciated. So now that you kind of understand uh, what we did for the metadata project, I'm going to pass it back to Cindy so she can talk to us about the scanning project. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so the scanning project was our other big project. Um, and like I said earlier, this was all support staff, whereas the metadata was uh, concentrated on and information staff. Um, so we started getting ready for the scanning project in early November. Uh, we knew with the trajectory of cases rising, uh, especially in Franklin County, but really throughout the state, uh, it wasn't a question of if we would have to go back to curbside, but when. Um, so we, uh, we created stations. There were nine scanning stations throughout the third floor of Main Library. Uh, we used two different types of scanners. We actually uh, we, we had a lot of support from, from our administrative team, uh, and they okayed the purchase of five additional scanners um, that we will be using in LHG going, going forward. Um, and project management worked with us on where we could put the stations as far as where um, network access uh, went um, uh, and access to power, because power is important as well. Uh, and we also worked with IT on uh, not only the back end, getting getting everybody access to uh, the servers that they needed to save items to, but also IT set up the stations. They 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 ordered those scanners, um, and so we had a lot of help there too. Um, we started by pulling materials to scan. Um, we started with all those Col those Columbus City plans um, that are are re really very cool um, and not. You can't find it anywhere else except for uh, our digital collection, My History Now. Uh, and then we decided on a process on how, how we wanted to get the items from being pulled to being completed uh, and every, every step in between um, that somebody would have to put their, their hands on the books. Um, and so the first thing we had to do at when we, we, pull, we had to decide what to scan, what we want to pull. So we were limited by the scanner type um, all of our scanners were flatbeds. We do have a book scanner that we did train, we did end up training somebody on, um, but there was only one of those. And so if anything was too tightly bound, we couldn't do it. It had to be in a binder or report cover, it, or it had to just be um, stapled or, or loosely bound or able to take those staples out, um, which we, we did sometimes. And that, that's what led to uh, a rehousing project that Nicole will, will talk a little bit about. Uh, in a minute, um, and we have in our in our division we have two distinct collections: local history and genealogy. And so we decided uh, mostly to stay with the local history collection, um, and that's that's majority of what we scanned because those are the items that are most unique to us. Whereas the genealogy, if there's a history of Franklin County. There might be five libraries in the state that have it. If it's if it's a Columbus redlining report from 1956, or slum clearance report from 1956, we might be the only ones that have it. We probably are. Um, and so that goes into the rarity of items. We, we chose the ones that, that we are the only ones that have it, or the items that we are the only ones that have it. Um, and then we also had to look at copyright. Could we scan this, could we scan this item and put it online and still be within our legal rights. Um, and so we, we used a digital copyright slider when we pulled items and to, to look at what we, what we could pull. Um, and so um, the entire process, so pro we, we did project sheets for every single item we pulled. And so this ended up being over 1500 uh, project sheets that had to be created for, for these items. Um, luckily, it was a lot of copy and pasting. And so project sheets were something we've been using since I joined the division in uh, November 2019. When I joined, this is uh, what it looked like 
lots of link spaces, not a lot of specific, you had to put the specifics in. Um, when we were in, uh, during the pandemic, when we were thinking about how we were going to restart scanning, we also looked at the project sheet again, and we had a, we had a second version that it's a little bit more step-by-step, step, but this is still a little bit too much information for somebody who wasn't used to scanning, wasn't used to scanning to our standards. Um, and so we created a third project sheet that was pretty much just the, just the facts, ma'am. Um, and it also gave uh, the person scanning room at the bottom to tell us if something was wrong with the item, if something was weird about the images, um, and just give us give us some notes, but we could also give them just the specifics of what how they need to scan it and how they need to set up their settings within the, the scanning software. Um, and then uh, note, I know Nicole talked about Smartsheets a lot during her part, um, but Smartsheets is a really great tool that we've used before, but not not to the extent that we we are using it now. Um, and so the, we would put every single item into the smart sheet. Nicole, there we go. Um, and so everybody has had access to this and it was, we, we utilize Microsoft um, Outlook, Teams. Um, and so you could lo log into this with your Microsoft username um, with your at columbuslibrary.org email. Um, and so it was easy to get everybody access. Um, there, there weren't hoops to jump through. And so we put every item in here. Um, we had everybody search by barcode. So they would find the barcode, they would search for it, they'd find their item. And then the, uh, the paper clip on the left is where you attach, it, sh it shows the attachment that is the project sheet. So they would download the project sheet and then when, when they're done and print it, and then when they're, when they're done, they would put the project sheet in the completed items. So we have those notes. So we have that record uh, that it was done. Um, and you could go back for just a second, Nicole. There we go. Um, and so a lot of, like the metadata sheet, a lot of the back end stuff's on the right. But we had the we had call number, the title. So people could check that they had the right barcode, that they didn't um, accidentally put in a wrong number. Um, and then they could claim it. And they put, they would claim it, they'd put their name on it, and then they put when they, they finished it. And then that was the cue for whoever was uploading it to go back in and and upload the item to, uh, to Content DM. Uh, and then the next step was uh, the physical workflow. So uh, we created the physical place uh, for the items to scan, we can, uh, completed cart, for staff to put them when they're done. Everybody had their own individual, uh, we, we put tape on tables and put and sectioned off places pe people could put their things um, because not everybody, not everybody was done with an item at the end of their shift. Um, we had a lot of carryover. Everybody had their own microfiber cloth for to wipe down the scanner uh, or the scanner glass um, if, there, if there was dust on it. Um, and then for scheduling, we utilized um, shifts in Microsoft Teams. So we, um, this was the first time uh, we, we used shifts. We created slots for each scanning station. Um, and at the beginning, we had, for about eight weeks, we had uh, three four-hour shifts. Um, and so we had somebody from the LHG team there from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, and Eventually, we went back to three three-hour shifts. So we had somebody there, nine a.m. to six p.m., which was a lot, a lot more manageable from a, from our standpoint um, in the project management sense. Um, um, and we were always very mindful that this was this was the height of the pandemic. The cases were the highest they've been. It was it was a dangerous time. But we we trained everybody got really good at talking people through how to do things instead of point coming up close and trying to point. Um, 
I got, we, we stood six feet away as we, as we trained. Um, it was always things were, things were quarantined between somebody touching each item. Um, we had sanitizer around for everybody. Um, and then the completed items. So once, once everything was completed, it went on a cart. The people who were the, the managers who were uploading the items would, would take those items, get the project sheets, see if there's anything wrong or see, see if anybody had any trouble with, with the items. Um, and then they would upload those, those items. And once they uploaded the item on the, on the smart sheet, they put the, the link to our digital collection. Um, and that I'm using that link slowly to go through. And again, there were 1500 items to go through and add the link to the catalog record. And so eventually um, everything we scan will have that link in the catalog and that link will go to their, their record on my history. So uh, I mentioned image replacement real quick. So we scanned, we rescanned all these images before the pandemic, and we we're trying to figure out how we wanted to uh, replace them. And so it was a perfect project for for support staff. IT downloaded the Content DM project client onto branch computers. They're able to do it the home branch. This is an example. The top picture is what it looked like before. Um, it was out of focus. It was weirdly edited as far as color goes the resolution was bad it was not acceptable to publish it anywhere um, because it just because it was so low whereas the bottom is the replacement image um, that is now and that is what is now in my history um, and you can zoom in on it you can get detail uh, and it looks a, a lot better than that top top image um, and, and this part Sorry. Uh, and this project was, uh, it was done by CSS's support staff. It was uh, run by our support staff in LHG uh, under the supervision of one of our managers. Great. Yeah. And the other thing that we had people work on um, were some side projects. So again, Cindy mentioned how we had some star scanners and we pulled them to work on some other projects. So King Arts, uh, complex processing. So we had more images coming in from the King Arts complex and more photographs. And we had to process those, get those rehoused into acid-free folders and um, had identifiers written on them so we can send those off to be scanned because the King Arts complex was awarded a metadata mini grant. Um, so we were sending those off to be scanned uh, by a company. So we had to have those processed. We also had a collection of materials from a local architect, Joel Tiford, and those materials were brought in on foam core. We had one of our uh, team members pull them off of foam core and rehouse them um, safely for archival collection. And then we also just had some general rehousing. Like Cindy said, we came across some materials that needed some care while we were doing the scanning project. So we were able to rehouse those as well. So now that you have an understanding of the four uh, projects that we had for our curbside projects, we want to share with you the results. And so for the metadata project, we had over 1500 hours spent on it and over 5100 records that were edited and metadata was added or updated. For the scanning project, we had over 3000 hours on it and over 128,000 images scanned. Um, and then for image replacement, we had over 500 hours and over 874, uh, 8,740 images that were uh, replaced with those higher quality images. And then for the side projects, we also had about 1,300, more than 1,300 photos processed so that we could have those sent off for scanning. And these stats are only from August uh, 10, 2020 till the end of May. Uh, and so there's actually even more metadata that was done before we started keeping track of it with those uh, statistic sheets. So we are just so grateful and excited that we were able to get so much accomplished uh, this way. But we want to talk to you about our takeaways uh, so we can find out what you know we did wrong or what we learned from this so you can do it better when you do it in, at your place of work. 
So to go through these, I'll start off, uh, start small and expand. That sounds like a really simple thing, but with the metadata project, we started with too many collections and had to dwindle it down uh, like that funnel there. Um, but if we could do it over again, we'd probably just start with those two collections and just work in those from the beginning. Smart Sheets, uh, again, like Cindy said, we used it before the pandemic, but it has just shown uh, to be really useful for us and we figured out how to make it work for us. So we're going to continue to use Smart Sheets for our scanning, uh, just for the LHD team and even for the metadata project because that is still ongoing. We still have help from people from other branches helping us with metadata. So we're going to continue to use that. And I know Cindy wanted to say something about Smart Sheets as well and how we're going to continue to use those with the project sheets. So. Um, so before the pandemic, the project sheet was kept with the actual item being scanned um, on a shelf before it got scanned. Um, and so that things could get lost in the shuffle. Sometimes they got forgotten about. Um, and so now with the project sheet in smart sheets, the now the scanner can go in, see what needs scanned and then and then get the the item or our own scanning staff. We wouldn't have done that with the with the branch, the people coming in from the branches. Um, but you know, now, think, now it'll get lost in the shuffle. It'll always be there. Um, and if we need to do something quick and copy and paste, we can download one and then put out, put the new information in, into it. Um, and then our, the communication with staff, um, we found that te teams, we've been using teams since um, last March, since the pandemic began um, and we started working from home. Um, but we found that especially crowdsourcing the, uh, the identifications, it's a, it's a lot of fun because I'm, I'm not from Columbus, neither is Nicole. Uh, and so trying to figure out and solve the mystery of, of where these things are, why, why is this person with Herman Munster and who are they? Um, and it, it's just a lot of fun to kind of collaborate and get together and, and share knowledge, share knowledge with everybody. That's a real example, by the way. There was a picture in King Arts where Herman Munster was there with locals from Columbus and we're like, why? What? What's happening? So that was fun. Um, but the last point is just quality control. We used to have like a physical sheet of quality control. We would like fill out and pass back and forth. And what the pandemic has taught us is we don't need to do that. We can streamline that process, do it all within smart sheets. And we will definitely continue to use that as uh, in the future as well. So those were our takeaways, and that was the, the story of our curbside projects at Columbus Metropolitan Library in local history and genealogy. We're going to have some time for questions here at the end for both us and for Ginny at Kent State. Uh, but if you have any questions for us specifically that you don't get to ask now or you think of later, send us an email at history at columbuslibrary.org, and we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so if you have any questions for the presenters, please put them in the Q&A box like you're doing all conference. Um, we have a few minutes here. So um, I have a couple of questions while you guys post your questions. Um, Ginny, I noticed that you said, look, said that your students were on Google, a Google platform, and then you guys are on a Microsoft platform. Did you find trouble trying to navigate between those two since, you know, they're obviously just using Google and using Outlook or, or Microsoft? So I have not, but I know other of my colleagues have struggled with that. Um, the previous institution I was at, we were also mostly Gmail, Google Drive suite. Um, so that's where I kind of just normally gravitate to. We were just told last week that we're going to have to start getting things off the next year. So I need to figure out something else. But um, students, I don't think had any problem. The few times I have had to add them onto, um, it's been Teams and something else. I have to create a special student account. So I've had more issues trying to get them to use um, Microsoft projects and vice versa. I think they're more Google natives. <laughs> So that they got to volunteer. So did you, once they volunteered, did you get to select or, or was it like they volunteered, you just had to use um, them? Or? So we kind of were seeing what the, um, you know, what people would jump on. We had kind of had some conversations, you know, what if everybody picks the same project and it's just too many people for, you know, too little work, but I think it spread out. I just, I took everybody that volunteered. Um, it was kind of nice because there were a few that we'd wrap up and be able to kind of put out a new call for like a new 
part of the like transcription project, um, but it was pretty evenly spread. I think um, I was just thinking last week about some of the other projects that you know, like the orchids that didn't really get um, worked on during that project, but I think are really good ones, even as we like the staff and faculty here continue to be remote. All right, now Nicole and Cindy, um, did you do you think that institutional knowledge of what you guys have to offer was increased through this collaboration? Like through working with the the, lab, the information and service um, workers, oh, sorry, employees. There, sorry. I, would, I mean, I, I I would definitely say yes. Um, a lot of a, a lot of people don't don't quite know what goes on in local history and genealogy, um, and so I think this really helped. Um, and hopefully they, they'll take that knowledge back to the branches and share it with people who didn't get to participate in, in the projects. Yeah, we've actually talked about the concept of having like uh, liaisons to share what local history and genealogy is doing. And basically by having them come into our, our department or even just the remote work that they did, they kind of got to learn it firsthand and can now share it with others. So it was a really good experience in that way. So in regards to that, how were staff selected? Was there was all the staff that were there kind of funneled into the projects or was there like a selection process where you were able to choose who got sent to you or were they sent to you, like they selected for you? They so selected it, for us. Uh, yeah, it was the, the managers told told people, you have to do this project or you have to take PCO if you want, if you want your full pay. I mean, they were given a few options. It wasn't yeah. just the yes, it was projects not. that were available. They had some, um, library card projects that were made available, um, but they were all by the, the job status, so like uh, or your job title. So those were the options that they were given based on what level they were at. Yeah. Now yeah, kinda... I came up with some projects, so we weren't the only ones. Okay. Now, question for all of you. Um, how do you kind of see, like, do you see these moving forward? Can like maybe bring them brought up again, or is this kind of like, now that the pandemic's done, we'll take the lessons learned, but these projects will kind of have to like change and or shift. I can start, like I, like I said, the metadata project is still going. So we're just so grateful to be able to have the librarians and managers and some of the information services specialists, uh, those paraprofessionals who are still have any time left in their schedule to be able to work on those. I don't know if we'll ever be able to do something like the scanning project again. I would love that, but I'm just not sure how the logistics would work <laughs> in normal times, but yeah. Yeah, I would, I would hope we'd be able to do it again if we ever get a large collection or something that we need. We have a, a, a specialized time frame for. Um, it'd be really great to have have that kind of camaraderie again I don't I don't think it has to end just because the pandemic's over <laughs> we're hoping we can continue them here maybe not as much for student workers so that's a possibility but um with their uh HR just announced a uh, remote work policy starting in October so we're kind of hoping that this might be something that staff could do too um but it's still early but yeah hopefully Maybe something we can keep plugging along. Okay, if anyone has a, a question, um, now is your time to get it in. But um, if not, um, like I said, you have their contact information. If you think of a question later, I'm sure they would love to answer. Um, so I just want to thank you all for coming out and thank you to our presenters again. It was fantastic. And thank you all for joining us at SOA's 2021 virtual conference. Um, I think I will now turn the floor over to Sherry um, and we'll get the business meeting started. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sherry Gowdy, president of SOA. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from land that was once protected and nurtured by the Shawnee people. I call this land home, and in doing so, I wish to honor and affirm my commitment to understanding the historical legacies and contributions of the Shawnee. The past two days have been filled with great presentations, posters, and discussions about how we've navigated the past year and our plans to move forward. And I truly appreciate hearing what some of you have been doing to amplify diverse voices and transformative social justice work. I'd like to thank all of our presenters Thank you so much. 
And I want to thank also Ben Garcia for the beautiful remembrance journey that you took us on this morning. Thank you for trusting us with something so deeply personal. And thank you for giving a term to how I also view the work that we do. It truly is a vocation, a calling born of wonder and passion and to leave the world better than we found it. Now I'd like to make a few closing remarks before we get to the business meeting. One year ago, archival organizations, including SOA, issued statements condemning police brutality and the oppression of black lives after the brutal murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many more. We also stated our solidarity with all oppressed people and a commitment to dismantling white supremacy within our institutions. At that same time, Lael Hughes Watkins, a former SOA Merit Award winner for her founding of Project Stand at Kent State, tweeted, the archival profession is in the midst of its own appra appraisal process, an interrogation of its development and an analysis of its utility. What has emerged from this critical examination of our organizations and institutions? Most significantly, we are assessing, as Ben said this morning, looking to reset our workplaces. Just like all institutions, our archives, libraries, and museums were founded on supremacist ideas that purposely and unjustly prioritized some while abusing and marginalizing others. We are asking ourselves, how can we repair that? What can we do? As archivists, librarians, and memory workers, we are in a powerful position. And I think all of us want to use those positions to do good and to make a difference in the world. But this current point in history puts us in a precarious position as well. We are watching movements for social change across our country and globally. We are still living through a pandemic despite the returns to normalcy. And we are reckoning with our democracy while trying to save it from complete eradication. We each have a personal stake and reaction to what is happening. And that makes it difficult to be unaffected, leads to the burden of emotional labor, and can leave us less objective. But no one is asking us to solve these problems on our own. We are all in this together. And this work is not new, as Dorothy Berry pointed out last year at SAA's Community Reflection on Black Lives and Archives. There are archivists and memory workers that have been doing the work of decolonizing and dismantling white supremacy in the archives for decades. So collectively, with open ears, minds, and hearts, along with our staff, volunteers, boards, and communities, and with the networks of all of us across the state, we can commit ourselves to social responsibility, justice, and anti-racism in the work that we do and all of those that we work with. We are the stewards of history. When the future looks back on this history, what record will we leave for them? The future cannot look back on these times and assess what we went through if we have not taken a prism perspective to our collecting. There are so many sides to us and to our communities. We are complex. But white supremacy and racism in our archives denies complexity. Telling limited narratives and accounts steals complexity. Yusuf Amawale said a few weeks ago at the Archiving the Black Web conference, we are trying to restore the complexity of our humanity. This is why all stories are so important. The joy and the pain, the triumphs and the trials, the truth. No matter the controversy, no matter the negative press, our charge is to restore that complexity. Yes, we are in a precarious position and we have much responsibility. We are in positions of power and we must learn to leverage that power, privilege, and our resources for good and share it with our communities. Because in the end, the lives are what matter. We'll move along to the business meeting portion of the conference. Um, first, I'd like to start off by uh, thanking once again, those who made this virtual conference possible. Thank you to all of you who are serving on EPC and planning this conference. Thank you to the co-chairs of EPC, Rachel Bussert and Bill Madro, and everyone on EPC for all of your hard work. 
Bill, as your term as co-chair ends, I want to thank you for your dedication and hard work. And I also want to welcome Ann Rickbust, the new co-chair for this coming year. Thank you, Betsy Hedler, for all you do to make this conference possible. And many thanks to OHC for providing the platform and technical assistance to allow us to bring this conference to the virtual stage. Uh, I'd like to uh, also thank everyone who participated in our online election this year. A big thanks to the nominating committee led by past president Robin Heiss for making this part of SOA possible. I would like to welcome the newly elected council members. Congratulations to our new vice president, president-elect Amy Miller, associate university archivist at the University of Dayton. Our new secretary, Jen Johnson, digitization consultant and Ohio Digitization Network project coordinator at the State Library of Ohio. And our newest council member, Sasha Griffin, university archivist and special collections librarian at Denison University. Thank you for volunteering your time and efforts to SOA and all of the candidates who ran, thank you. I would also like to thank Adam Wanter for his leadership over the past two years. You have led us through the pandemic and I am so grateful to your service and hard work. Adam, who transitions from president to past president is someone I'm sure I'll be calling on quite often for advice as I begin my term as president. Thank you also to Robin Heiss who has served as past president the past two years and has been a crucial leader on council. Thank you to all of council for all of you, all that you do and all the emails that you have to sort. That said, I would like to congratulate and welcome also Abigail Sachs as the new editor in chief of the Ohio Archivist. I welcome you to council and look forward to working with you. A big thank you to Kayla Harris, who has served as editor in chief for the past three and a half years. As her term ends, I want to thank you, Kayla, for your commitment to SOA. You are a shining example of dedication and I don't know how you manage it all. Thank you also for leaving us with an important call to action in your final post in Ohio Archivist. This is our organization and it will only be what we put into it. I ask all of us to assess what we are putting into this organization and recommit ourselves as we move forward. This is more than a volunteer organization to me. It is a way to change to be the change that we want to see. I hope each of you will find an act on what you want it to be for you. Uh, next, I'd like to announce the winner of SOA's awards. I'd like to thank the membership and awards committee led by Stephanie Schreffler and Matt Francis for your hard work to recruit new members and ensuring we appropriately recognize those who are doing outstanding work. Much appreciation to you all. I'd like to start by announcing SOA's 2021 History Day Award winners. History Day was held virtually in April this year. The junior award went to Angela D'Souza from Birchwood School of Hawken for her junior individual documentary, The Cleveland Free Net, How a Case Western Reserve University Experiment Opened a New World of Communication. And the senior award went to Brendan Zbenek, Mary Basilian, and Zara Braun, from Shaker Heights High School for their senior group performance, Tinker versus Des Moines, the student-led fight for free speech. Congratulations to these students and thank you to all who participate in History Day. Uh, next, I'd like to announce the Student and New Professional Scholarship Awards. SOA awards scholarships to students and new archival professionals, which consists of a one-year membership to SOA and a $100 stipend for professional development purposes, such as buying books or attending trainings. The winners for 2021 are Brid Bridget Retzloff, a new professional who has worked at the University of Dayton for one and a half years, splitting her time between instruction, reference, and archival work. She has co-written a case study about teaching about patents as primary sources, which was published by SAA's case studies on teaching with primary sources series. She co-presented yesterday at this very conference with her presentation entitled Creative Co Collaboration, Transformative Times, Teaching with Archival and Primary Sources. She will also soon begin processing the papers of Irma Bombeck. Grace Thanasu is a third year undergraduate student at the University of Akron, pursuing degrees in history and political science and a certificate in museums and archive studies. 
In her work at the Institute for Human Science and Culture at the University of Akron, she has created metadata for the, the digitized David P. Campbell postcard collection. She also processed the Virginia Senders papers and wrote a finding aid for the collection. She also has also interned at the Cincinnati Museum Center, developing curriculum for summer camps. Kimberly Teeple is completing her MSI program at Florida State University and is a member of the Crawford County chapter of the Ohio Genealogical Society. She is leading a team of volunteers to convert documents currently on CDs to PDFs and to index these documents and make them available online. She has also volunteered at the Marvin Memorial Library in Shelby, Ohio, where she digitized the family history collection and uploaded it to, uploaded it to the Ohio Memory Project. She also recently accepted a job as a data analyst at Ohio, Uni Ohio State University. Congratulations, Kimberly, and congratulations to all of those winners. Finally, I would like to announce the winners of this year's Merit Award. The SOA Merit Award is given to individuals or organizations that have by excellence in deed, action, or initiatives improve the state of archives in Ohio over the past year. The 2021 SOA Merit Award is presented to the University of Akron's Sesquicentennial Oral History Project. The project was led by Vic, Victor Fleischer, University Archivist, and Dr. Gregory Wilson, Professor of History. They trained graduate and undergraduate students to interview members of the University of Akron community, focusing particularly on the often unheard stories of African-Americans, women, the LGBTQ plus community, and people with disabilities. This project thus helped fill the gaps in the historical record and the university archives collections. It is our pleasure today to present the 2021 Merit Award to the University of Akron. If we were in person, there would be a roaring applause at this point, and we would ask you to come to the stage to accept a beautiful plaque for your achievement. I hope that you'll settle for our overwhelming appreciation for the work you have done, and the plaque will be mailed to you. Congratulations to you, Vic and Dr. Wilson. I wanna thank all of the committees for their hard work this past year. Not mentioned already, the Advocacy and Outreach Committee, led by Jennifer Baker and Natalie Fritz, the a and Committee advocates for the importance of archives with regards to legislation that impacts us and for programming such as Statehood Day. And they also ensure that we have a really cool poster every year highlighting collections from across the state. Thank you for your work. The Marketing and Communications Committee, led by Janet Carlton and Amanda Rindler, makes sure our website and social media, as well as the listserv, keeps us and everyone else informed about important events and issues impacting us. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you so, so much. Thanks also to the Strategic Planning Committee for keeping tabs on our mission and our vision and ensuring we have a plan to meet our goals. I look forward to working with you more on these issues this coming year. Last year, the newly formed Social Justice and Black Lives Matter Task Force was formed. Jessica Hayes, thank you for serving as the inaugural chair of this committee. I applaud your efforts to provide resources and tools for moving from statements to action when it comes to advocating and affirming that Black Lives Matter and social justice is a priority. I look forward to the task force leading a forum in the coming months to continue the discussion about what we are doing, what we can do, and what we should do moving forward. I'd also like to thank Bill Madro for serving as SOA's representative to the Ohio Historical Records Advisory Board. And a thank you to Janet Carlton for serving as SOA's rep to RAC, the Regional Archival Associations Consortium. Janet's term ends in August. So if anyone is interested in assuming this role, please reach out to me. For anyone with concerns about travel to SAA's annual conference, since SAA hosts RAC's communications and in-person meetings, we're in a new virtual world, and I believe there's lasting accommodations for virtual uh, conferencing, so probably not going to be an issue. It's also not required to be a member of SAA to participate in RAC. And this is a great opportunity to represent Ohio archives while engaging in leadership on a national level. I hope you'll consider this opportunity and reach out to me. On a related note, the call for applications and nominations for open positions on the RAC steering committee is tomorrow. 
This is a leadership opportunity and different from SOA's RAC representative position that I just mentioned. If you're interested in a leadership position within RAC, please reach out to me and I can forward you the application information so you can get it filled out and turned in by tomorrow. Thank you again to all of you for serving on committees and leading our organization. Without the hard work and dedication of all of those involved in these committees, we could not do all of the things. If you want more information about what great things have been accomplished, please check out our website for the council meeting minutes and committee reports. And now I would like to turn the mic over to our treasurer, Lisa Rickey, to give us a brief treasurer's report and update. All right, thank you. Can everybody hear me and see a report on the screen, hopefully? Okay, I'm going to assume yes and just keep talking. Uh, so since our last um, treasurer's report, uh, which took us up to February, uh, we have brought in uh, $1,496.03, um, which is almost entirely membership revenue. Yay, thank you all uh, for renewing. Um, and 43 cents of that is interest from the bank. I know it's sad, but um, I document it nonetheless. Uh, we had um, no, nothing paid out during this time period uh, going up through May 31st. Uh, so that, that brings us up to um, 17,993.60 in our checking account, plus 65 still in the cash box, same as it was this time last year, because. <laughs> We haven't had any in-person things for me to need a cash box. Um, so it's just hanging out in there. So our, our grand total is $18,058.60 to our collective name. Um, I, I took a look at the last five years of where we were at about this time, you know, at, at this meeting in the last five years. And the balance varied from like 11,000 to just over $18,000. So I think this looks pretty good. Um, our biggest expenses are usually the conference. And then there's also, you know, usually conference uh, registration fees and that all kind of brings everything on the budget, like way up into the thousands of, you know, pluses and minuses. But um, I'm not going to detail this, but if you're interested, here's our budget accounting and what's going on and where the money's been going and coming from. Uh, long story short, we're about $1,000 um, in the positive right now um, from our expenses versus income for the year. We still have a few things we'll be needing to pay um, related to this conference um, and some other stuff, but I think we're looking pretty good. Um, and also this report, if you just, um, if you just joined um, since March online, we don't have that. I don't have that money yet. We get that quarterly from um, OHC. So anything that any of you may have paid for online or if you made donations towards the conference, thank you. I know some of you did that. Um, those aren't reflected yet because I haven't gotten them yet. All right, I think I am done unless anyone has questions about any of this. Thank you, Lisa, very much. Appreciate that. And thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Betsy, would you like to wrap things up and give the last details about the evaluation forms? Certainly. Um... We will be, so um, as you know, we have been recording all of the sessions. Um, they will be available shortly um, on the SOA's YouTube page and depending um, on how um, the communications team decides to do it, possibly from the SOA webpage to the YouTube page. Um, give us a minute on that one <laughs> for processing a video. Um, and I will be emailing um, a link to the full conference evaluation. But I will also put it in the chat um, so this is the full conference evaluation. Um, you've been filling out session evaluations along the way. This is the full conference evaluation. I will also be emailing this to everyone. So if you click on the link in the chat and you do it now, you don't have to pay any attention to the email that I send. But otherwise, that's what we got.
All right. Thank you once again to everyone for attending and see you in the future.